She has gone down in history as America's greatest miser. Yet when she died in 1916, Hetty Green left an estate valued at over $100 million in 1916. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money now. She ate cold oatmeal because it cost to heat it. Her son had to suffer a leg amputation because she delayed so long looking for a free clinic that his case became incurable. She was wealthy, yet she chose to live like a pauper. Eccentric? Certainly. Crazy? Perhaps, but nobody could ever prove it. She was so foolish that she hastened her own death by bringing on an attack of apoplexy while arguing about the value of drinking skimmed milk. But Hetty Green is an illustration of way too many Christians. They have limitless wealth at their disposal, and yet they live like paupers. It was to this kind of Christian that Paul wrote the epistle to the Ephesians. Ephesians is a letter in praise of limitless wealth. And as soon as the preliminaries were concluded in verses 1 and 2, Paul launched right into his excitement over all that we have in Christ. Now we're not talking about limitless material wealth, as you'll see as we go through this. What we're going to see this morning is that God showers his blessings on us. That he chooses to love us and to save us and that he adopted us into his family. And that he accepts us as a legitimate part of that family. We are chosen and cherished members of God's family. I got one amen. We are chosen and cherished members of God's family. Isn't that amazing? We don't deserve any of this. But what we're about to see is God absolutely opening the windows of heaven. In fact, it even says that. And showering his blessings upon us. There's an ages-old debate over the nature of salvation. It's often framed as Calvinism versus Arminianism. But I think that's too simplistic, and in my opinion, frankly, too divisive. That said, the debate rages on. Among Baptists, the debate has historic ties in England going back to the early 1600s, when the general Baptists, who were more Arminian in their thinking, and the particular Baptists, who are more Calvinistic in their thinking, developed, those two lines of churches developed in England. The debate has centered on what role God plays in salvation and what role man plays in salvation. Does our salvation flow from us toward God? We are moving in God's direction, and because of that we end up getting saved. Or does salvation flow from God toward us? Now, the reason I bring this up is that Ephesians 1 is central to that debate. In Ephesians 1, we read things like this. He chose us in him, that is, he the Father chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. Verse 3. The Father predestined us to adoption as sons, according to the good pleasure of his will. Verse 4. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Verse 9. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his own will. Verse 11. And all of that sounds very much like God's sovereignty. And it does relate to God's sovereignty. 
But on the other side of the ledger, seemingly on the other side of the ledger, Paul wrote these things in verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. Well, that sounds like something I did. In whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And again, that sounds like something I did. So is God's sovereignty paramount or is human responsibility front and center? Am I saved because God chose me? Or am I saved because I decided to believe? Well, let me say at the outset, yes. That might sound like a cop-out, but scripture clearly teaches both the sovereignty of God that he is in control of everything over all time and the responsibility of man, that every individual is held responsible for the spiritual choice that he or she makes. Ephesians 2.8 puts it this way, For by grace you have been saved through faith, God's grace coupled with my faith. Now that said, there is an origination point for salvation. And it is not in the desperately wicked heart of man. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 tells us, The heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. That's not where salvation originates. The relationship of a Christian to our Father is born from above. And verses 3 through 6 make that clear. So if you haven't already done so, open your Bibles to Ephesians 1. And let's begin in verse 3 as we work through these four verses that describe for us how much God has given us and how wealthy we really are. Notice verse 3, that God is the one who blesses me. Blessed be or blessed the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Notice that the word be and places in that verse, if you're looking at the New King James, are in italics. That means those are supplied. It actually would read, blessed the God and Father, and at the end it would say, blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Now the first part of verse 3 spells out the source of these blessings. The blessings come from, you can say it, God. That's where blessings come from. Now, we, we might be blessed by somebody in our neighborhood. Somebody may come by and say, hey, Thanksgiving's coming up. We have two turkeys. Here's an extra one for you. Oh, thank you. That's a blessing. And, and so there may be a human agent involved with this, but it still is coming from God. The blessings we receive come from God. So Paul starts by saying, blessed... The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is blessed. The word blessed is in the position of emphasis in the verse. It stands first. And so he's talking about how blessed God is, how wonderful God is, how, how praiseworthy God is. And that's where Paul starts with praise. His heart is soaring as he thinks about what God has done and as he honors God with a statement of his value and his worthiness that it is to be praised. Verse 3 is a focus on God the Father. And in point of fact, verses 3 through 6 are all one sentence. for this enti So this entire thing is a focus on God the Father. He's the subject. He's the one from whom all blessings flow. He's the Father of lights from whom every good and perfect gift comes down. James chapter 1 verse 17. And he's also the subject of Paul's statements here in this, in this passage. So that's the one who blesses. That's the source. Comes from God. And then verse 3 continues by saying, Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. So that's a description of the kinds of blessings Paul is talking about. We often think of blessings in temporal terms. In fact, what I just mentioned about a neighbor coming over with a turkey would, would be a blessing in temporal terms. We, we bow it before a meal and we thank God for the food that we are about to receive. We, um, we, we thank God for family. 
I just, we have thanked God for the safe arrival of our newest granddaughter. We, we thank God for things that are temporal blessings. And there's nothing wrong with thanking God for temporal blessings. Shame on us if we don't. The story of the, uh, the lepers that were all healed and the one Samaritan that came back to thank uh, Jesus because he had healed him was, a thank, was thanksgiving for a temporal blessing. So there's nothing wrong with thanking God for health and for financial um, supply and for friends and for family. Those are legitimate blessings of God. But Paul here is more focused on the blessings we receive from being part of God's family, the spiritual blessings. In fact, you could read this verse this way, who has blessed us with every blessing from the Spirit. In, in the original language, it just mentions the word spirit. And they've kind of turned that into what we, what we read here as spiritual blessings, but blessings from the spirit of God, who blesses us in all kinds of different ways. Everything the spirit of God has to offer is ours. Warren Wearsby said, everything we need for a successful, satisfying Christian life, everything we need. God the Father blesses us through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, these blessings don't originate on earth. It says they flow from God in the heavenlies. That is in heaven. God does bless us with earthly blessings, but Paul is rejoicing in the blessings that we receive that come from a place higher up than earth. Those blessings are ours because we are in Christ. We belong to Christ. Ephesians 2.6 says we are seated in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. And that relationship is why we have access to the heavenly blessings from the Spirit. So God is the one who blesses us. Notice verse 4. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Jesus said we didn't choose him. He chose us. John chapter 15, verse 16, speaking to his disciples, he said, you didn't choose me, I chose you. And that applies to us as well. At the beginning of the word, uh, of the verse, the words just as translate a word that means because. So verse 4 is a statement that says this is why verse 3 is true. We have all these spiritual blessings. We have all these blessings from the Spirit of God in our lives because, and then we get to verse 4, because he, God the Father, chose us, those of us who are believers, in Christ Jesus. When it says in him, it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, before the foundation of the world. Before there was a world, before Genesis 1, before there was anything or anyone besides God, in the eternal counsels of the Godhead, he chose me. Now, several things come to mind. The first one is that God is eternal. He existed before time and he is timeless into eternity past and into eternity future. I've said this to you before, bears repeating. I, I struggle with the idea of somebody who is eternal in the past. I can think of something that goes on and on and on and on and on, but something that never had a beginning, I, everything I know has a beginning, except God. In eternity past, he is eternal. We are not eternal in the past. But we were known to God in eternity past. That's an interesting thought. I was known to God, but I didn't exist yet. I was known to God before I came into existence, before anyone had an, an idea that there would be some, somebody such as Stan Lightfoot. Before that ever happened, I was known to God. And there was a point in eternity past when God chose 
those who would become his people, including me. And if you know Christ as your Savior, including you. Before you were born, before any human lived on earth, before earth was formed, God knew you and God chose you for himself to be his child. And once again, we were chosen to be in him, that is, in Christ. Paul goes on to say that there's a reason for this. The word that is purpose. So that. So that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He chose us to be holy, he says. We, we think of the word holy, we think of you know somebody who um, is goody two-shoes, somebody who is um, nearly morally perfect. You know, that kind of thing is what comes to our mind when we think about holy. But the word holy means separate. So it does have the idea of being separate from sin, but there's also a positive separateness, separated to God. So God chose us, selected us to be his own possession so that we would be like Christ, so that we would be part of his family. He has chosen us to be part of his possession. Set aside to God as his own. Set apart from sin so that we would be like God instead of like the world. So he chose us to be holy. He also chose us to be without blame before him in love. Now, blameless doesn't mean sinless. Sinless means there is no sin that could ever be attached to me. I am sinless. That would be Jesus. Only Jesus. I am not sinless. Lest you start saying, yeah, you're really not. You're kind of a disgusting human being. You're not sinless either. None of us are sinless. Christ is, but none of us are. This is not on, is it? If I step away, it sounds like I'm, I've lost my... Yes? No? I just flipped the switch. Is it bad? Back the other way. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. Interlude. Wasn't even a commercial. So blameless doesn't mean sinless, although there will come a day when we will be sinless, for we shall see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. The word blameless means without reproach which means no one can come and accuse me of something. Is there somebody who's accusing us on a regular basis? Job chapter 1 and 2? Yeah. In fact, the word Satan means accuser. So we have somebody who does not like us, who will accuse us every chance he gets, but we need to live our lives in such a manner that we are without reproach so that he doesn't have grounds on which he can blame us. But even more important than that, because we can all, he can find something for all of us, even more important than that, we are in him. We are in Christ. Which means Satan can't find a way to attack us because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That's why we're above reproach. Another way to translate that word is unblemished. And when you think about the Old Testament sacrifices, what you had in an Old Testament sacrifice was an animal that was examined very closely by the priest to be sure that it did not have a physical blemish. So it didn't have one leg shorter than the other. It didn't have a blind eye. It didn't have an ear that was malformed. It didn't have anything like that. It was perfectly unblemished. And that's the only kind of lamb that was available as a sacrifice. And by the way, the reason for that is because the perfect lamb of God, Jesus Christ, would one day die in our place. So the picture of the unblemished lamb in the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus Christ, who would be the unblemished lamb of God upon the cross of Calvary. There could be no blemish in that sacrificial animal, or it was not fit as an offering to God. So when we stand before him, as people who are redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ, there is no blemish in us. 
doesn't mean you're sinless. It means you're covered. That's why we're worthy to stand in his presence. Now the last two words in the verse, in verse 4, I believe actually go with verse 5. So verse 4 would read, Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestined us to, be, to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself. So the third idea in this section is that God is the one who adopted me. Let me read the rest of the verse. Uh, I'll read the whole verse. In love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. God is the one who adopted me. The concepts of choice and adoption fit together very nicely in verses 4 and 5. Some of you are, by the way, that's, that's sort of the international symbol for adoption. That's why that's up there. But I thought it was very interesting because it, the triangle is also a symbol of the Godhead. So God is the one who adopted us. Some of you have uh, are familiar with adoption because it has been a part of your family. Either you were adopted or your, uh, you as a parent did some adopting. We have an adopted grandchild. You know, we don't view that child as adopted. We know she is. But we don't view her that way. She's part of our family. She's our youngest son's daughter. He adopted her. He and his wife adopted her. They love her. They loved her from the moment that they saw her. And they chose her. Now, I understand the adoption agency and they were chosen and blah, 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 blah. But they walked into the hospital and they adopted a child. A child that they chose to love. As human parents make that conscious choice to adopt a child into their family, God made such a choice to adopt us into his family. And that adoption was predestined. The word ha tra translated having predestined means that he all, pardon me, that he already decided in, <clears throat> that he already decided in advance to set, aside, set us aside for himself. Cough drop break. You didn't realize we we're going to have all these little interruptions during the message, did you? I'm just doing that so that you won't be upset when it goes long. You'll have reasons why we must have done that. <coughs> the word predestined means to mark out a boundary in advance. So it's a word that that kind of goes into the idea of property. Uh, here's my boundary, and I marked it out in advance before anybody else came along. Here's my boundaries. Luke used the word in Acts 4.28 to indicate that the actions of Herod and of Pilate and of the Romans, that is in, in that verse it's, it refers to as the Gentiles, but he's talking about the Romans, that those actions were determined in advance before Jesus ever showed up in front of them. Those actions were already determined. Paul used the word in 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to indicate that the mystery of God's work in this present age, including the church, and God's reception of Gentiles into the church was determined before the ages. Aren't you glad? How many, how many ethnic Jews do we have here today? I'm not one either. I'm really glad that God said, you know what, we're going to allow Gentiles into the church. Because if that weren't the case, none of us would be here. And Paul used the word here in Ephesians 1 again, in verse 11, to indicate that our future inheritance was determined in advance. Verse 11 says, In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. The word further clarifies the phrase in verse 4 that says that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, before we took our first breath. God marked us out as his own. One writer indicated that predestination refers to purposes. God had a reason for this, and that's one of the reasons why you see that and so that in here, because God's 
purposes are involved in this. It's not just that he loves us more than he loves other people. That's not the point here at all. I'm not any more worthy of salvation than anybody else, and I mean anybody else. You name him. I'm not worthy of salvation more than anybody else. But God had a purpose in choosing me, and he marked me out as his own. And then, as we noted earlier, we're adopted. That, that word, adopted, is never used of Jesus as a son. He is the only begotten, sometimes translated the one and only son of God, the only one who is God, the son. I am a son of God. I am not the son of God. I am a son of God. I am not God, the son. I am a son of God by adoption. Jesus was never referred to in Scripture as adopted. We are sons of God through faith, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. We who believe in his name have been given the right to become the children of God, John chapter 1, verse 12. So we are adopted by faith. In human families, in God's family, adoption does not indicate a lower class of family relationship. Just let that sink in, because I think sometimes we view other Christians sometimes from that perspective. That's a different class of Christian. If I am in the family of God as a son, and you are in the family of God as a son, we stand equal before God. It doesn't matter how much money you make. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter any, where you were born. None of that stuff matters. We are adopted sons of God. The phrase, as sons, shows that it's not simply a household servant. We are legitimate sons with all the benefits of sonship. In fact, the word of the use, sons, the, the use of the word sons instead of the, the word ch children, indicates the privilege of rank. We are in the family, not simply in the household. We are heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, Romans 8, 17. And the last half of the verse tells us that God is pleased by this arrangement because it is in accordance with his will. He has a purpose in choosing us. The purpose for me is different than the purpose for you, but he has a purpose. One aspect of that, or two aspects of that purpose, have already been mentioned, that we'll be holy, that we'll be without blemish, without blame. But this purpose accords with his will. The choice to adopt us into his family is according to, because of what pleased God. God's determined will, here his purpose in saving us, is always in accordance with what pleases him. God wanted me. That's amazing to me. Because I look in the mirror every morning. And I could easily ask, and some mornings I do, why? Why would God want me? And you can do the same. Again, I'm not any better or worse than you are. None of us deserves what God gives us. But God wanted you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful? Again, there could have been a chorus of amens right there. Oh, thank you. The single voice chorus are going there. And that's why he saved you, because he wanted you. And then verse 6 says this, To the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. So finally, God is the one who accepts me. He blesses me. He chose me. He adopted me. And he accepts me. The ultimate goal of our salvation is the glory of God. In point of fact, the ultimate goal of your existence is the glory of God. It's why you're here. God created you to bring glory to himself. The phrase likely should read in the verse, so that we will praise his glorious grace. God's grace, his favor which we don't deserve, that's the idea behind the word grace, 
is worthy of our praise, especially as it relates to our salvation. We are born in sin, without Christ and without hope. That's how we start life. But God, in his great grace, stepped in, sent his Son, and provided a way out of our hopeless dilemma. And it was hopeless. You can't do anything about your sin situation. Only God could do something, and he did. He sent his Son. And that's worthy of our praise. So as Paul gets to verse 6, he says, To the praise of his glorious grace. And through that undeserved favor, he placed us in a position we also don't deserve. Accepted. Now when you see where it says accepted in the beloved, some people will say that looks like to them that we are accepted within the family of God. Which is a true statement, but that's not what this is saying. This is saying, I am accepted in the beloved one. I'm accepted in Christ. Next Sunday when we get into um, verses 7 and following, you're going to see verse 7 says, in him or in whom. Verse 11, in him, in whom. Verse 13, in him. Over and over, Paul comes back to the idea that we are in Christ, that we belong to him. Interesting that the word made accepted is the verb form of the word grace. So we have been favored by God. We have been made to be favored by God. He favored us by placing us in Christ, in union with the beloved one. I have all the blessings God can give me through the Spirit. I was chosen by God to be in his family, by adoption. And I am an accepted, favored part of his family in Christ. I am, and you are, if you know Christ as your Savior, truly chosen and cherished. Isn't that amazing? I mean, this is how the book starts. And it, it, it develops from here. But Paul gets excited about this. He's not just writing this to say, eh, I'm trying to fill space. No, Paul's excited about this. And we should be as well. Salvation is a work of God. God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills has saved us and blessed us. He's the one who loved us enough to send his son to die in our place. He's the one who came looking for us while we were still sinners. Romans tells us why we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5.8. Charles Spurgeon used to use the phrase, the hound of heaven. And he used that phrase with the idea that that a hound is something that is hot on the trail of the prey. Only in this case, the prey is actually us, and it's good that the hound of heaven, the hound of heaven is chasing us down and bringing us into his family. So not chasing us down to kill us, chasing us down to save us. The hound of heaven is hot on our trail, or was hot on our trail, and brought us to Christ. If you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Savior, the hound of heaven is still hot on your trail. And he wants you to know Christ. He wants you to become a child of the living God. He wants you to be part of an adopted family. And we are the beneficiaries. We are wealthy beyond our wildest dreams. Not in material things necessarily. Could be, but not necessarily but in the things that matter for time and eternity. So let's not be the spiritual equivalent of Hetty Green. Rich beyond belief, but living like a spiritual pauper. Instead, let's live our lives in light of the spiritual wealth that has been given to us because we are children of the living God. Let's bow for prayer. Father, thank you for uh, the excitement of Paul. Um, I know in my own mind, I I sometimes think of Paul as a pretty dispassionate person, but um, Paul could get really excited about things, both positive and negative. He He could say some things that were pretty strong in a negative fashion, and he could also say some things that were just 
magnificent and exalting God. And this is this first part of Ephesians is one of those sections where he just gets excited about God. Thank you that you have blessed us, that you have given us the blessings that the Spirit of God has showered upon us. We are ticking those blessings off. We have a relationship with the living God. It's amazing given our sinful background. We have a Savior who's preparing a place for us because He came and died for our sins and we trusted Him. Because that's the case, we're in the family of God. And we have the Spirit of God living within us and all those things, that's just, a, that's just scratching the surface of the blessings that we have in the heavenlies. And then, Father, we have been chosen and adopted into the family of God. And you accept us. And we're grateful for that. And again, Father, I pray if there's somebody here who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that today would be the day that they say, I, I, I don't want to live separate from God anymore. I want to be a part of God's family. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I want to have these kinds of blessings in my life. Thank you for our time together in your word. Use it as you see fit and as your spirit sees fit to minister to each of us, we pray in Jesus' name.